Shalom, shalom. You're listening to Live Internet Studies. This is episode number 252. My name is Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi. Let's open with a quick word of prayer. Avino Malkino, our Father, our King, thank you for this time that we can spend together, Lord. We can study your words. We can equip ourselves. We can uh, avail ourselves of the power of the Holy Spirit. We can fellowship with one another, even though it's across the miles. And Lord, we believe that you are faithful and that you are revealing truths to us. You are giving us um, a voice. You are giving us the opportunity to share our witness with other people. And um, these are responsibilities that we take very seriously. So we continue to um, look to you. You are the one who uh, wrote scripture. and We know that you're the one who understands it the best. And even though we have differences of opinion, Lord, to help us to remember that there are there are um, central goals of the Bible. There are central topics that we should all be grounded in, rooted in, and firmly established in. And then there are other topics that there aren't as many details, and so there's a bit more nuance. There are uh, differences of opinion. Lord, help us not to divide on these types of issues. Help us to uh, just keep the um, the uh, uh, which we say the foundational pillars in place, so that we can have a a um, a firm understanding of your truths. Uh, help us to continue to reach out with messianic sympathy towards one another, uh, forgiving one another, um, supporting one another, uh, praying for one another, and building one another up in Yeshua. And these are the things that we're going to major on. And we'll be careful, Lord, to give you the praise and the glory, Bashim Yeshua. Amen. Thank you for joining me during these live internet studies. My name is Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi. These studies are broken up into two segments. If you've ever been to my website at www tetzetorah.com that's t-e-t-z-e-t-o-r-a-h dot com and you click on one of the links in the upper right corner on the home page one of them should say live internet studies something like that when you begin to click around you'll notice that there are two segments there's the hour-long segment which is entitled eschatology a biblical study of end time events where we are reading and studying and talking about topics related right now to the rapture so if you're interested in rapture topics join us for the first segment of the live internet study we're working our way really towards the book of revelation we're just taking it topic by topic like you can see on your screen i know there's a little topical indexed index and uh, we're in the part where it says topic 10 raptor views and overview then the second segment is 30 minutes long it's apologetic in nature it's really kind of a continuation of the older apologetic study that i did some time ago entitled um shema uh, uh exploring the shema discussions on the issues of trinity except this one is entitled a trinitarian response to biblical unitarianism and in this study, the 30-minute study, we're looking at verses supplied by BiblicalUnitarian.com that, from their perspective, are definitively non-Trinitarian, although all of the verses are actually verses that Trinitarians have long historically held to be triadic or verses that hint at or outright tell us about God and His triune nature. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all all three God, yet three persons. But Biblical Unitarian disagrees, and so we're comparing and contrasting their perspective on those passages with the Trinitarian, which is the position I hold. And currently we're in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Okay, let's jump over to the rapture uh, topic in eschatology. So we left off last week, again, we're in topic 10 rapture views and the overview, and we left off last week discussing the views of rapture. Of course, there are four kind of main views of rapture. I'm showing you a graphic on the screen right now with the charts that indicate the, the four main views. There's what's called the pre-tribulational rapture, pre-tribulation rapture, or pre-trib rapture. It goes by a few different names. I, I tend to just call it pre-trib. And this puts the rapture in uh, relative proximity to what's called the seven-year tribulation. This puts the tribulation at the very beginning of this seven-year period that is identified as tribulation or sometimes it's just called God's wrath and 
By comparison, it puts the second coming at the far right side, the very end of the seven years. We have another view that's popular today called mid-trib. And just like it sounds, it puts the tribulation right in the middle. And that's it cuts God's wrath in half, and it divides between what's known as tribulation in the first three and a half years of the seven years, and God's wrath on the last half. It still has the second coming at the far right. Most of the charts do. I think every chart does, really. But it puts the tribulation, uh, the uh, rapture, right in the middle of this seven-year slice. Then we've got a view that we've been kind of uh, parked out on just for a few studies called post-trib rapture. Post-tribulationism has its rapture at the far right of the chart, nearly uh, uh, synonymous with the second coming. This particular view has a lot of kind of nuances to it from different uh, people who hold to post-trib, people who've kind of rejected pre-trib and switched over. But uh, a, a, a kind of a central feature of this is that the rapture is simply at the farthest right, which means Christians endure the entire seven-year tribulation and wrath, uh, if you want to call them both the same thing. Second coming is at the far right, like I like most charts, and that's um, one of the main features of post-trib. It's, it's right in the name, post-trib rapture. And then the last view uh, that we're going to work our way towards eventually which is the view that I hold to myself, is called Pre-Wrath Rapture. Um, the name itself is fairly new. I'll, I'll admit that. It is, uh, you know, it's only been around for 50 or 60 or uh, 70 years or so, as far as I can tell. The father of Pre-Wrath Rapture being Marvin uh, Rosenthal, if I'm, if I'm correct, or it might be um, Robert Van Campen. There's debate on which one of them came up with the name first. But... Uh, those two are big names in the pre-wrath camps. And where's the rapture fall in this view? Well, we've still got the same seven-year slice, but now the rapture falls just a little farther to the um, closer to the end or farther to the right on any given chart. So it's not at the very left like a pre-trib. It's not in the middle like a mid-trib. It's not at the farthest right like a post-trib. It's kind of three-quarters of the way in. And again, this is an approximation for pre pre rathers. Uh, we admit we're not saying that it's exactly three and a half year or at the middle of the three and a half. We we really don't know. We're simply saying it's after the great tribulation, but before God's wrath or before the day of the Lord. So there are two events, uh, two uh, which you might call bookends to God's wrath, pre wrath on the front end second coming on the on the far end so we'll get to that view in time what we did last week is we looked at um pastor john piper's perspective of this question when is the rapture and he decidedly takes what appears to be a post-trib uh perspective we also recognized or i keep mentioning that in my research um there are five good solid uh bible teachers uh let's see i'll, I'll in the post-production i'll flash their photos on the screen so you can see them but if i remember them uh in the order that you're going to see them on the screen uh, from the left to right there's uh dr michael brown who's well known a messianic apologist and then there is dr craig keener in fact dr brown and dr keener authored a book together on why I don't believe in a pre-trib rapture or something to that effect. So it's a post-trib response to pre-trib theology. And so that, I believe, puts both of them in the pre-trib, pre, uh, post-trib camp. I'm quite certain Dr. Keener is. Now, I got, now I'm drawing some, some doubts, but I'll go back and look that up either way. For now, I believe he is post-trib. Next to that, we have, um, or after that, I should say, we have... Um, Joel Richardson, who is a very well-known post-tribber, although, I, in all fairness, his post-trib theology is what he describes as a hybrid between post-trib and pre-wrath, which I'll show you the, the chart here in a moment why that matters. So, uh, Joel Richardson, who's he's the author of the, the Islamic Antichrist and When a Jew Rules the World, uh, he's got a lot of good resources that I am very... Uh, supportive of that I'm fond of and that I think are very very solid although um, uh, again we disagree exactly on when the when the rapture is and then the fourth gentleman's photo that shows up in my post uh, production is 
uh, Professor Douglas Moo. And he's a very well-established, very solid uh, Bible exegete, but holds to the post-trib. And then lastly, we've got John Piper here. So that puts five. Well, if you remember from last week, and go back and listen to the notes if, you don't, if you're not sure, two defining passages that cause John Piper to, to believe that it's a post-trib are the passages in Paul's letters to the Thessalonians. And there, Paul talks about how that there are two events that take place at the second coming of Jesus, but the events that are described are decidedly Armageddon-type sounding language. And when we look at any of those charts, let me go back here again, going backwards now, if you look at the pre-wrath chart, the second coming is at the far right, which conveniently is also where Armageddon is. I suppose I could pull a one of the give me one of the charts. Armageddon shows up near the farthest right of any one of these given charts. In other words, near the end of the 70th week, um, either at the end or 30 days after the end. Just like Daniel talked about, there are 30 days um, that extend beyond the 70th week, and then another 45 days that extend beyond the 30 days, totaling 75 uh, total days that extend beyond the 70th week of Daniel. So Armageddon is over there, and that's where John Piper says... Uh, the language that Paul uses in the Thessalonian letters, the ones that he re that he that we looked at last week, that's why he he holds a largely to a pre or a post trib uh, position. Going back up to that post trib position again, Armageddon would be on the far right of this chart. Same one, same thing here, and same thing here. So the Raptor itself moves moves around in the chart, but the second coming stays fixed as does the Battle of Armageddon for just about every other um, person who studies Scripture. So, John Piper also noticed that there is a Greek word used to describe our meeting Christ in the air. This time I do have this pulled up. Classic rapture discussions include a number of Greek terms that show up in our English Bibles to describe either the movement of Christ towards us as he begins to appear in the air and then move towards planet Earth to rapture us or 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 uh, touch down on planet Earth, depending on whether you're talking about a rapture discussion or a uh, uh, day of I'm sorry um, a second coming discussion. But when we're talking about the general movement of Yeshua coming to meet us, the classic word that shows up is the English word coming, uh, but can also be translated as presence or arrival or advent, second coming of Christ, things like that. Parousia is Strong's number 3952, like you can see on my screen. And a lot of Bible teachers uh, make it a special emphasis to, real, to point out that this word shows up as a description of one event in the Bible, and John Piper talked about that as well in his discussion. There are not two comings of Christ like the pre-trib tries to kind of insinuate or try to um, suppose or imagine in his perspective using his word. Instead of two comings, there's only one coming hinted at throughout the entire Bible. It's the parousia. And that is the word that also conveniently carries with it a bit of this idea of people going out to meet whoever the the uh, significant person is that's arriving. Like if it's a king visiting a place, the people would go out to meet him like they did, like the people went out to meet Yeshua on Palm Sunday. So we've got parousia, that's one of the first words. Then another one of the words that shows up in our discussions on rapture. These are kind of overview terms that we're looking at right now. We're not d diving deep into these real quick for, at this point, but I'm making you aware of them. And when the time comes, I can uh, grab them and uh, pick on them and, and z uh, kind of slow down and, and drill down into them if we need to. But harpazo is actually the uh, Greek word, Strong's number 726, that is the origin word to our English word, uh, catch up or seize or snatch away but the latin version is uh rapire or rapira or something to that effect and that's where we get our english word rapture so a lot of people will start by telling you well the word rapture is not the bible big deal well of course it was written in english uh, the bible wasn't written in english or even in latin so that's one of the silliest arguments i ever heard um in other words, it's 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 nonsense to point out words that, that don't show up in the Bible or in certain places. Therefore, the Bible uh, uh, ostensibly can't be 
um, teaching those concepts because <laughs> the corresponding English words don't show up. I'm laughing because it, it's, it, it really is a laughable argument. So it's used over and over in certain um, by people who um, think that it's advancing the argument in some way. The word Bible doesn't even show up in the Bible. Give me a break. Trinity doesn't show up in the Bible. Um, you know, people who try to say these, these types of arguments. Um, okay, so rapture doesn't show up in the Bible, but the word harpazo does. And we'll look at that in time. That is what the snatching away, the seizing uh, of someone and carrying them off uh, for either a good or a bad reason. Uh, Episunago, from where we get our word synagogue, Strong's number 1996, is a word that shows up in Bible passages that talks about gathering us, where Yeshua says he'll send forth his angels, Matthew 24, around verse 31 or something around that. He'll send forth, or verse 30 and 31, he'll send forth his angels to gather his elect. This is the word that shows up when it talks about gathering to collect, to gather, to assemble. Paul also uses a word that talks about gathering, and I believe it might be a different word that we'll see here in a moment. Um, Paul talks about us meeting the Lord in the air in the Thessalonian passage. This is um, apontesis, uh, apon, apon, uh, yeah, apontesis. And this word has been translated strong's number 529 has been tra translated as uh, meeting or to meet and this is the word that shows up only i think two or three times let me double check yeah there we go it shows up three times in the bible and uh it shows up once in matthew once in acts and then the thessalonian passage the famous uh we'll meet the, the lord in the air that paul uh uses and the uh, what John Piper highlighted for us last week is that this Greek word apontesis is a technical term it's used everywhere in the Bible those three times. It's always used about people going out to meet someone important rather than that person having to come all the way to them. The people go out to meet this person. And this is the this is kind of similar to the um the uh other one the um the uh par the uh, parousia parousia word where this idea that yeshua is yeshua's presence is being felt he's he's about to arrive where he needs to be but then we go up to meet him in the air this is the word that's uh, used in those verses there's another word that shows up um that's similar uh to let me move these around because i want these two to be next to each other the um Episunago word where it's the, the gather together. Paul has a word, I believe this is in Paul's writings. Let me scroll down and look at the references real quick, and then I'll tell you. So there's one in Matthew, one in uh, Matthew, Luke, Luke, Romans, Romans, Corinthians. There's some Paul, Pauline usage, Corinthians, Thessalonians. G, uh, Paul uses this word in 1 Thessalonians 1.10. Which, the, which is the word, uh, the, the reference that I was talking about. He talks about that, that Yeshua is the one that rescues us or delivers us or draws us to himself. So it's um, similar in some ways to gathering and collecting us to gather together. It's also similar to the um, harpazo word. But what's nice about this word is it also has this very strong nuance of rescuing from danger. In other words, it definitely implies movement out of the sphere of danger rather than protection from within. There's another Greek word we'll look at for that. But this word itself has drawing to oneself, ruomai. And uh, ruomai is Strong's number 4506. Paul uses it to... Uh, to, inch, uh, to comfort the Thessalonian believers and to affirm to them uh, that Jesus is the one who rescues us from danger, from wrath, from destruction. And the eschatological implication being that not just rescuing us from the wrath of God itself, uh, but also rescuing us. He has the ability to rescue us even from persecution if he wants to. But more often than not, as John Piper pointed out, God leaves us in place when it comes to persecution and just uh, uses it as a vehicle to help us to build our endurance and trust and faith in God rather than taking us out of danger. But when, when the time comes, God has the ability to actually move us out of the way where the danger is. And this is one of those times I believe that Paul is using this word in that way. 
uh, contextually in, in the Thessalonian verse there. Uh, two more, or I'm sorry, three more real quick, and then we'll jump into the study. Uh, these are kind of the technical notes um, that people need to kind of appreciate the study, that uh, the location that the study is going. Strong's number five, number 25, apontasis, which we already looked at, is the act of meeting. So this is us moving up into the air to meet the Lord in the air. This is the word that's used in many of those passages. And so shall we meet the Lord in the air. Paul uses it in his Thessalonian passage that we just looked at. Uh, Strong's number 5083, Tereo. Tereo, I'm sorry. Uh, Tereo. This word shows up in Revelation 3.10. It's a famous word that's coupled with the Greek word ek. So we have some combination of um, um, Tereo ek, the the guarding from from out of or out from guarding if you kind of trying to translate them kind of woodenly a guarding guarding from within or guarding from without ek implies uh, a, like location of movement out or from something and the passage that is utilized by many in these discussions is that Similar to some of the other words where there's protection or there's deliverance or there's salvation or something in context, the passage in Revelation 3.10 says that Yeshua promises one of those churches because you have kept my word, a promise and of truth, etc., that I will keep you from the hour of testing. And if the context of the word uh, hour of testing there is uh, tribulation and or wrath of God, depending on which uh, view of rapture you take, then we have Yeshua promising to keep us. But the force of this word is to guard even while in the midst of it. It can be either that nuance to guard or it can be to keep you from altogether. So it can go either way. It's got nuances uh, that work either way. But important is that at least it allows for a discussion that doesn't remove Christians uh, from earth during tribulation or even wrath. Rather, it shelters them in place, puts them in protective custody, kind of Goshen principle style, like what happened in the Exodus, where God didn't remove the children of Israel out of Egypt while the plagues were raining down. Instead, he sheltered them in place. He put a supernatural uh, bubble around them, you know, kind of like Wakanda's shield, uh, keeping everyone, everything outside of Wakanda or something like that. I know that's a poor analogy. It just popped into my head. But God can do that, right? So that's Tereo. Uh, and then the last word is um, apostasia. And apostasia, I'm sorry, apostasia, from where we get our word apostasy, is also the name of the book of the Bible at the farthest end, Revelation. That's where we get the word uh, Revelation also. It's made up of two words. I'm sorry, not this word. What am I thinking? That's that's um, um, apocalyp apocalypsis. Sorry, it's confusing. Strong's number 646, apostasia. Apostasia. This word um, is used by Paul in the Thessalonian letters to talk about the timing of the day of the Lord and the fact that the day of the Lord is not going to happen unless two things happen first. One of them is what he calls the um, apostasia and the other is the uh, revealing of the man of lawlessness. And uh, the, the man of lawlessness, of course, is the Antichrist. So Paul says the day of the Lord is not going to happen until the great apostasy and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Well, this word... Um, Apostasia is translated either as defection or revolt or apostasy, but it can also be translated as departure. But the context demands, and it's not a very, it's not used very often. Uh, the word is only, the word only shows up twice, and in both of those locations, I'm just going to scroll down and show them to you. In Acts, it's used to depart from Moses or forsake, meaning a spiritual departure, not to physically leave him, but to forsake Moses, to apostatize from Moses. That's the context of the passage there, and it's obviously a spiritual departure because by the time Acts was written, Moses was dead, so it wasn't any physical leaving Moses. It was actually a spiritual departure, so there's nothing physical about it. But when you get to the Thessalonian passage, Paul says that the day of the Lord is not going to show up until the apostasy or the departure takes place, uh, the following way is how it's translated in KJV, until the next place place, and the man of laws and sisters revealed. Pete Preach Rippers um, kind of pick up on this and say, this word could be translated as departure, meaning rapture. As in Christians departing from planet Earth. Yes, that's a possibility. We could look at that. But given the fact that this is a very s seldom uh, uh, used word, only using shows up one other time in the Bible, 
within the context of the other one, which we know for sure is not physical removal, de- physical departure. It's it's definitely spiritual apostasy, right? The way the one that we would be familiar with when we say apostasy in the spiritual sense. There's no reason to think that or f- to force that me- uh, a different meaning on the Thessalonian passage. Uh, in other words, it doesn't have to mean f- uh, physical departure. It can also mean spiritual departure. And that's the way that most uh, rapturist, uh, rapture type um, discussions go is that they believe we're, it's talking about a spiritual departure from the Christian faith, a, a spiritual departure from the true faith, and that's the position I hold to. But I, I again, I've heard others say that it's it could mean physical departure, but I haven't seen that in the context yet. But when the time comes, we'll have those discussions, um, and we can entertain uh, why maybe that might be a good fit. So those are all the Greek terms for the technical part of our discussion. Now let's go back over to where we're going to be um, parked out tonight for the most part. So moving past John Piper's uh, answer to what is rapture, he talked about what it is. It is the snatching away, the catching up of believers unto into the air to meet Christ, and then quickly coming back down to planet Earth in our in our new bodies to populate the millennial time period, which takes place from his perspective at the very end of the seventieth week of Daniel. So near the end of the seven years, and around the time of Armageddon. And thus, he's a post-tribulationist in that perspective. Let's continue to look at post-tribulationism before we jump directly into pre-trib and then finally into pre-wrath, which is the position that I hold to. This idea of post-tribulationism and its contrast to pre-trib, so post to trib, of course, only one of these views can be right. When I look at the post-trip perspective and then I look at the pre-wrath perspective, I can see that there might be some really nuanced differences between those because neither one of us knows exactly when the rapture or the day of the Lord is going to commence. We don't know exactly when the second coming is going to happen. We know it's near the end of the 70th week. Both of us agree that's closer to the end rather than closer to the beginning like pre-tribbers teach. And the mid-tripper, mid-tripper, mid-trib position, mid-tribber, if you've noticed, I'm, I'm not spending a lot of time talking about the mid-trib position because in most theological circles, the mid-trib has been kind of subsumed under the pre-wrath position because of how similar in location they are to each other, both being uh, not near the, the polar ends, the bookends of the 70th week of Daniel. Like the post-trib is on one end, the pre-trib is on the other end, mid-trib and pre-wrath are both located near the center of the 70th week. And so for that reason, a lot of mid-tribbers have just abandoned that view and simply moved either over to pre-wrath or something to that effect. But I want to continue looking for one more week at post-trib before I move directly into pre-trib. And the reason I'm looking at post-trib tonight is because of its strong contrast against pre-trib. But this time I want to look at it through the lens of one of the most famous pre-tribbers whose name is let's see where is it here uh president and professor of systematic well give me a second i'm gonna change the view of the page it's it's walvard uh doctor let me see if i can blow up his picture and you can see who i'm talking about this gentleman right here uh john f uh walvard um he's a longtime president of dallas theological seminary and he was um, as this page is talking, he was one of the most prominent evangelical scholars of his generation. He's considered perhaps the world's foremost interpreter of Bible prophecy, so eschatology, and he's best known for his best-selling works on Bible prophecy. And he is a pre-tribulationist, right? He believes in pre-tribulational rapture. I disagree with pre-trib rapture, but I highly respect his research um into this field and so we're going to borrow his notes as been reproduced on bible.org's uh website and and uh resource for us and um i'm going to read through it uh, fairly non-stop he talks about the rapture and the day of the lord in first thessalonians 5 and um the reason i'm bringing this this p- passage into the discussion i want you to kind of perk your ears up for this part he's going to 
take the pre-trib position and thus he's going to try to show you why the post-trib doesn't work and so that's one of the reasons why i'm putting this up here is because we just got through learning about the post-trib position from john piper and so uh if you only listen to one session you might think wow that's it post-trib that makes sense but now we're going to look at why from a pre-tribber why post-trib doesn't work right and then next week we'll begin to look at pre-trib and we'll um dig more deeply into it so we can define it before we eventually turn into pre-wrath and show you why i think post uh, pre-trib doesn't work <laughs> right again i'm a pre-rather so i'm saying that the other positions have weaknesses well let's listen to dr walvard who is going to highlight some of the weaknesses of the post trib position but he's going to do it by explaining that the rapture and the day of the lord bear significance in our study because as we're going to find out a good number of um uh, bible students me included believe that the rapture and the day of the lord are very close to one another very close to one another as in perhaps even separated only by a part of a day like as in day and night or uh, one event kicks off the other event by comparison let me show you this uh, last chart and this is another reason why it's relevant when you look at pre-trib all right this is dr walverd's position he's a pre-tribber this is remember the most popular position on planet earth today this is the one most widely held by most christians it's the one that a lot of people are abandoning and jumping ship to post-trib or even pre-wrath but pre-trib where's the rapture the rapture is on the far right it's at the beginning of the seven years where's the second coming it's on the f i'm sorry uh, let's try that one again where's the rapture it's on the far left right it's at the beginning of the seven years where's the second coming it's on the far right so these events are separated by seven years but notice that the entire seven year slice by most pre-trib standards is described as either the tribulation the great tribulation or god's wrath so the three and a half years and three and a half years might be tribulation and great tribulation but for all intents and purposes all of the seven years is assumed by uh this view as trib and god's wrath is a name that's labeled uh as a label that's used in conjunction or synonymous with tribulation and thus when the bible tells us that we're not destined to wrath like first thessalonians um 5 9 a very famous passage god hath not destined us to wrath but to obtain salvation um something to that effect i'm paraphrasing well pre-tribbers jump on that and say well since we're not destined to wrath god has not appointed us to wrath that means we must be taken out of the way prior to wrath and if the entire seven year tribulation equals wrath well then we must exit the scene at the very beginning but germane to our study that we're going to be looking at is that the tribulation i'm sorry the rapture takes place and then wrath or tribulation begins meaning the events are uh right next to each other and this is important for the pre-trib position because of the language that we're going to read about in thessalonians that paul uses talks about those two events he talks about rescuing us or delivering us and he also talks about um paying back those who persecute us those who uh afflict us paying back with affliction those who afflict us the order is reversed he talks about their affliction first and then he talks about delivering us and john piper hit on that last week we took the, we looked at that but very important pre-tribbers say that we must be rescued first and then the wrath of god is poured out and this must take place at the beginning of the seventh week and because god's wrath it spans the entire seven seven year slice but when we sw uh, compare this to the post-trib view if the entire 70th week of daniel the entire seven years is god's wrath well then notice that the rapture takes place after the wrath of god the order is reversed we have wrath being poured out on this chart first or tribulation and then the rapture is post trib or since trib and wrath are um used uh, interconnectedly or sometimes conflated with one another in many discussions then we could say that post classic post tribbers are also post rathers which means the rapture takes place post wrath or post trib um 
if that's the case, well, then we would find verses that would seem to support that. But Dr. Walvoord is going to explain to us that this isn't the case. So that was part of where why I'm kind of prepping you so we can understand what he's about to say. All right, we're about halfway into our hour-long study, so I need to get going so we can hit all of this and study this entire um uh, article. It's it's a bit lengthy, but I'm going to try and read it without um, pausing and explaining a lot. Uh, it's fairly self-explanatory. So, rapture and the day of the Lord, which, from my understanding, are events that are essentially going to happen back to back. There's not going to be a big, long seven-year gap between them. So, in this regard, I agree with Dr. Walvert here, who is the um, uh, a very famous pre-tribber. I believe I conf- uh, agree with pre-tribbers, and therefore, I disagree with classic post-tribbers that the wrath of God takes place in uh, before the rapture takes place. I've My understanding of the chronology is that the rapture is first, and then the day of the Lord, i.e. the wrath of God, is second in sequence, in chronology. By the way, in all fairness, uh, Joel Richardson, who's one of those five gentlemen that I keep flashing on the screen, he is a post-tribber but he departs from classic post-tribulationism in this regard. He does not believe that the wrath of God is poured out first and then the rapture takes place. He believes that the entire seven years is more kind of a tribulation period, and then near the very end, the rapture rapidly takes place. We go up real quick, we meet the Lord in the air, we come back down real quick, and then the wrath is poured out in, in rapid succession, and so, so he still places chronolo- chronologically rapture in front of wrath, but the wrath is drastically shortened. There's not a lot of time for the wrath to be poured out. The trumpets and the bowl judgments that we read about in Revelation starting in chapter 8, moving through about chapter 15, that would encompass the trumpets and the bowls. But from his perspective, he calls it a hybrid of the post-trib and the pre-wrath. So he retains uh, the chronology that I do, but he, he puts most of it at the far uh, right near the Armageddon slash Second Coming, like classic post-tribbers do. Okay, so let's read about Dr. Walvoord's uh, rejection of post-tribulationism as seen through the, the um, topic of the rapture and the day of the Lord in 1 Thessalonians 5. And I'm doing this because we just got through studying uh, Dr. Pi- uh, John, uh, I don't know if he's a doctor or not, but Pastor John Piper's um, perspective on the rapture and the day of the Lord in in First Thessalonians five, and according to uh, John Piper, uh, because of the language that shows up there, this is definitive proof that this must take place near the end of the seventieth week. In other words, it's Armageddon language. Is that the case? Let's read. Okay, so we've got uh, Dr. Walvoord's uh, credentials here: President and Professor of Systematic Theology, Dallas Theological Seminary. Okay, at least I think that might be it. Or he's a for- he's a former one, and the guy who wrote this is a is the current one. Okay, and this is, um, again, at uh, Bible.org, and it originally showed up in um, another um, uh, Bibliotheca Sacra, uh, a, um, a kind of a, a published a publish, a publishing um, uh, uh, series uh, that's available for, for Christians read through. Okay, let's just read through like this. And again, I'll try to read uh, largely without stopping because it's self-explanatory. These are Dr. Walvoord's uh, notes has been reproduced. There's a few typos in here when I read through it last time, so I'll uh, try to get past those. And also, again, Dr. Walvoord is a pre-tribber, and he's going to argue for pre-trib. He is rejecting the post-trib, and he's trying to highlight the weaknesses of the post-trib. The relationship of 1 Thessalonians 5 to the rapture has been debated by both pre-tribulationists and post-tribulationists with an amazing variety of opinions. The problem centers in the definition of the day of the Lord and its relationship to the rapture. Because a uh, relationship to the rapture, because there are differences of interpretation among both pre-tribulationists and post-tribulationists, generaliza- generalizations are inevitable. The center of the problem is, first of all, the question of what the day of the Lord means. A second question is why the day of the Lord is introduced immediately after discussion of the rapture in the Thessalonian passages. So, just let me back up. If you read First Thessalonians chapter four. And then turn right around and keep reading First Thessalonians chapter five, right one right after the other, remembering that Paul didn't write, actually write chapter breaks between it in his original letter. Then contextually, the rapture is spoken of in First Thessalonians four, 
right? We will meet the Lord in the air, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Rapture slash resurrection. Remember, those two events are synonymous. Rapture and resurrection are basically the same thing. The only difference between the two words are rapture would be the movement, the upward movement of the um living saints at the time when Jesus comes back versus resurrection would be the movement of the dead saints up to meet the Lord in the air. Of course, they go first. They precede those who are alive. So resurrection actually does take place chronologically first. And then immediately on the heels of that, the in other words, probably on the same day, right at the same moment, in the twinkling of an eye, so you wouldn't even, wouldn't even see the movement. But the res, the uh, living saints, the living believers, are caught up into the air. So that's the rapture aspect of resurrection, the part that was a mystery to the Old Testament readers and writers, but was only revealed by the time of the New Testament, uh, namely to Paul which is why you don't find rapture in the Old Testament. It's a very easy argument to uh, answer. It's because it was a mystery. God hid it from the Old Testament saints. But you do find re resurrection. It's all over the Bible. It's all over the Old Testament. So, um, this is the discussion. Uh, the rapture is introduced, uh, I'm sorry, Day of the Lord is introduced immediately after the discussion of the rapture, which suggests a chronology as well, right? Rapture first, then um, day of the Lord in that order, which is what post uh, pre tribs take, uh, pre rathers take, mid -trib mid -ra mid tribbers take as well. Uh, it's only the classic post tribbers that disagree on those orders there. So uh, let's keep reading. Um, third question is the meaning of specific statements related relating to the time of the rapture. All right, let's get into the meat of this article here, which is the meaning of the day of the Lord. And you're thinking, isn't this a rapture discussion? Ariel, I thought you're talking about rapture. Yes, I am. But in order for you to appreciate rapture, we have to appreciate two aspects. One this is the one I just mentioned. Rapture is a mystery. It's hidden from the Old Testament. Understand that? Okay. Rapture was hidden from the Old Testament readers and writers. It's revealed by Yeshua to Paul by his Holy Spirit and then also revealed to uh, John uh, in the book of Revelation. Although he doesn't use the word rapture and the snatching away and catching up, things like that. We have the large multitude that shows up in various places like, say, Revelation chapter 7 or chapter, yeah, chapter 7. A uh, large multitude that shows up in heaven after he talks about the 144,000. And it's natural to follow that chronology uh, to um, conclude that this resurrection, this uh, uh, multitude that shows up in heaven is the resurrected uh, church. Well, one main aspect that you need to uh, latch on to is that uh, rapture is, is a mystery, so it was hidden from the Old Testament saints. But the other aspect is the flip side of that. Resurrection, which is the resurrection, resurrection resurrecting of those who are believers in Christ, is found in the Old Testament. It's also found in the New Testament, but it is found in verses in uh, in the New Testament within proximity of an event known as the Day of the Lord, which is all over the Old Testament. It is featured prominently. In fact, if you look at all the prophecies in the Old Testament, the Day of the Lord is one of the central end-time prophecies. And we're talking not just about the near-term end of the Lord, which a Day of the Lord, which could have been any number of events that took place in Israel's past history. So there are different days of the Lord in a temporal sense, where they were kind of like physical deliverance from her uh, is, uh, physical enemies, her political enemies, uh, you know, geographical enemies, etc. Et like deliverance from Babylon, deliverance from the Assyrians, deliverance from the Egyptians. Those are types of the Day of the Lord, where God swoops in, rescues Israel, and then pours out judgment on any given a uh, big baddie who uh, carted off Israel into um, um, exile or, or, or punished Israel or, you know, put them in slavery like Egypt did, whatever. So the Exodus event is a type of day of the Lord where God drowned the Pharaoh in the Red Sea. That's a type of day of the Lord, but that's a temporal version. There is what's we would, what we're going to be properly labeling an eschatological day of the Lord, which, when you begin to read through all those Old Testament passages, like Isaiah, Ze Zephaniah, Joel, um, Malachi, um, uh, Zechariah, things like that, you're going to begin to realize that these events that are being described are, uh, are events that haven't happened yet. And the magnitude and who, who, they, um, who they impact 
must be something that hasn't taken place yet. Besides, when we get to some of the heavy passages like Zephaniah or Joel, the um, succession of what happens after the day of Lord are promises to Israel of this settled peace uh, from all her enemies, never to be subjugated again, never to be exiled again, never to be have to worry about um, uh, the destruction and trampling of Jerusalem by the Gentiles and things like that. And obviously that hasn't happened historically yet. So we know that there is an eschatological application of the day of the Lord that features in the Old Testament that's also carried over into the New. Now, why is that important for us? It's because when we get to the New Testament, we find that the rapture and the day of the Lord happen very closely to one another. And if we take if the Bible's taken in this literal fashion, then rapture takes place first and then day of the Lord takes next, takes place next. And they actually one, <coughs> excuse me, the rapture actually initiates the day of the Lord. So that when we look at the timing of the rapture, we're actually looking at the timing of the initiation of the day of the Lord. Not the duration of the day of the Lord, and not the end of the day of the Lord, but the the initial timing, the, the kickoff of the day of the Lord. What is the day of, when does the day of the Lord begin? And if we can answer that question, then we can answer the question when the rapture happens, according to most uh, Bible students. So that's why we're kind of having, while we're parking on this. All right, let's see how far I can get into this. I can see I might have to break this off and make this a part two. All right, uh, this is Dr. John Walvoord, who is a pre-tribber. He's going to argue against post-trib uh, rapture. References to the day of the Lord abound in the Old Testament and occur occasionally in the New. So he's got to define the day of the Lord first, and so I'm going to kind of read down through this somewhat quickly. Virtually everyone agrees that the judgments related to the second coming are in some sense a part of the day of the Lord. Definitions of the word day vary from a specific event to, such as a 24-hour day to an extended period of time stretching all the way from the rapture to the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ. Let me interject one more time. Uh, when, we're, when we're looking at rapture and day of the Lord, it, it is really best, and I think this is held by just about every person in my discussion uh, per view, pre-trib, mid-trib, uh, pre-wrath, and post-trib, all of us have the same perspective that I'm about to describe. Rapture is an event. It's a very fast event, very quick. According to Paul's terminology, it happens in the twinkling of an eye, right? Very quickly at the, ra at the last trump which I do not believe is the seventh trumpet, but we'll get into that in time. So how fast is rapture? How long does rapture, um, uh, 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 how long is it? How long, what's the, the duration of it? The span of time? It's in the twinkling of an eye. So it's quick. It's an event. So we're going to use that word event. By comparison, the day of the Lord is not an event. It is something that takes plays out over the course of time at least as uh as short as maybe 24 hours like if we want to take the word day there in its literal 24 hour sense so it is a 24 hour day so it is any it's not an event it is a um that's another word that we'll see here in a moment but let's not use the word event for day of the lord it's well, let's use something else not an event it could be as short as 24 hours but most of us most all of us believe that it's probably longer than 24 hours. It's probably at least a few months. Uh, by reckoning of Revelation chapter, oh, what is it, 15 or 16, uh, looking at the, um, no, it's Revelation chapter 9, the fifth trumpet judgment is said to have a duration of at least five months. So, um, if, if that's taken literal, then the day of the Lord is at least five months long, but it could be longer. So, it's not an event. It is uh, something longer than an event. So, that's what we're getting at. Okay, let's keep reading. Generally speaking, Walvoord says, Pre-tribulationists have identified the day of the Lord as the millennial kingdom, including the judgments that introduced the kingdom. This view was popularized by the 1917 edition of the Scofield Reference Bible. In this interpretation, for all practical purposes, the day of the Lord begins at the end or after the Great Tribulation. Okay, let's keep reading. Pre-tribulationists who see the day of the Lord beginning at the end of the Tribulation have difficulty harmonizing this with the pre-tribulational rapture. Post-tribulationists point out that 1 Thessalonians 5, referring to the day of the Lord, immediately follows chapter 4, which reveals the rapture. Again, I, I highlighted that as well, and it's worth noting. You've got to take notice of that. 
As chapter 5 is dealing with the beginning of the day of the Lord, the implication is that the rapture and the beginning of the day of the Lord occur at the same time. I also highlighted that. Capitalizing on the confusion among pre-tribulationists in defining the day of the Lord, Alexander Reese spends a chapter of his classic work on post-tribulationism, making the most of this particular argument. And then he uh, gives us a little more detail about that. Reese holds that the use of the expression the day indicates that the end time events all occur in rapid succession, including the translation of the church and the various judgments of the saints and the wicked. This is similar to what Joel Richardson talks about when he's talk, uh, describing his, his, his uh, hybrid uh, pre wrath slash post trib uh, perspective. Uh, Reese identifies the day of the Lord in 1 Thessalonians 5 with other references to the day as found in 1 Corinthians 3. Uh, 13 and Romans 13 11 through 12. Reese also uh, likewise so identifies the expressions in that day uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, uh, 2 Timothy 1 and 4, uh, chapter 4, the day of Christ, Philippians 1 10 and uh, chapter t- uh, 1. 1 6 1 10 and 2 16 uh, the day of lord jesus christ in 1 corinthians uh 7 through 8 2 corinthians 1 14 and the day of the lord 1 corinthians 5 4 to 5 and 2 2 thessalonians uh 2 1 to 3 um according to reese all refer to the same time and the same event uh, let's keep reading. Reese and other post-tribulationists, as their argument unfolds, lump together all references to the day, ignoring the context, arguing in a circle, assuming that post-tribulationism is true. As is frequently the case with difficult points of exegesis, it is of utmost importance that the context of each passage be considered before terms can be equated with similar wording elsewhere. Reese pays little attention to the variety of contextual backgrounds. So we see have. We of John Walvoord um, strongly disagreeing with Reese on the timing uh, and the uh, definitions of these events, Day of the Lord, Day of Christ, Day of God, etc., etc. I myself, by the way, I believe that they all are the same, Day of the Lord, Day of Christ, uh, Day of God. I believe, and that day, uh, I believe they all are referring to the same Time frame. So we're not talking about an event known as the rapture, but we are talking about the time frame known as the Day of the Lord. And when we begin to look at and, and compare scripture with scripture, I think we are looking at one single time frame, but it has bookends. It has the initial bookend known as the rapture and the far bookend on the right side of most of those charts called the second coming. But the, the, the time frame in the middle is the day of the Lord, a.k.a. the wrath of God, a.k.a. the day of Christ, the day of Jesus, that day, et cetera, et cetera. Let's keep going. The central problem, however, uh, Walvoord says, is that this kind of explanation assumes that the day is a simple and uncom- uncomplicated reference to a point in time, whereas in fact the total view of Scripture indicates something quite different. And the Persians, I'm not sure why this, where, where, why I think this is a typo here. And the Persians again gives graphic detail to the characteristics of the day of the Lord. It is described as quote a destruction from the Almighty. Uh, he says Persians. I'm not so sure who he's referring to there. According to verse 9, the day of the Lord cometh both cruel with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Sounds like an Old Testament quote there um, from either Joel or Zephaniah or one of those places. Uh, but continuing, next, Isaiah describes the stars and sun as being darkened, a prophecy that will be literally fulfilled in the Great Tribulation. In Isaiah 13, he states, uh, quote, And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Remember, John Walvoord is a pre-tribber. He believes that the entire seven years is the tribulation and the entire seven years is the wrath of God. He also believes that Christians are exempt from this time period and will therefore be pre-tribulationally raptured prior to the trib and prior to the wrath of God. Therefore, all of the language in the Old Testament that talks about punishment of the wicked, destruction of the haughty, etc., etc., is decidedly language that doesn't apply to Christians because we are not the uh, wicked. Uh, we're talking about a spiritual state of being. We're, we're not talking about just anyone who sins. We're talking about a technical use of the word sinner or the wicked or something to that effect. 
Let's keep reading. Beginning with verse 17, Isaiah describes the Medes as destroying Babylon. Remember, day of the Lord in its near-term application refers to God pouring out judgment upon a wicked kingdom such as ba you know any of the uh, ancient kingdoms uh, in Israel's history, uh, Egypt, Assyria, Medo-Persia, Medo Greece, uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, etc. Any of those uh, people could fit the description of uh, being a recipient of the day of the Lord. So Isaiah is talking about uh, the Medes destroying Babylon. Remember, Babylon came down and uh, exiled uh, Judah um, in the 6th century BC. And in so doing, they were used as God's instrument of punishment against Israel. And so that, that became a kind of day of the Lord against Israel, a punishment against Israel for their uh, gross disobedience, idolatry, uh, and rejection of God's uh, standards of truth, etc., etc. So God punished them by allowing Babylon to be the instrument of God and punish Israel. But at the same time, because of uh, Babylon's punishment or treatment of Israel, eventually God punished Babylon and that became another day of the Lord. And so God used the Medes and the, uh, the you know, the, um, the Medes and the Persians to come down, uh, come over, uh, swoop over uh, and uh, subjugate the Babylonians, in other words, to overtake them. Thus, Daniel chapter 2's statue that Nebuchadnezzar's dream portrayed, where the head of gold was Babylon, but the breast of silver, was, the chest of silver was the Medes and the Persians, right? They, they took over Babylon. So, Isaiah's describing this in his uh, book here. The Medes are destroying Babylon. In one sense, this has already been fulfilled, right? Day of the Lord. It happened already. In another sense, Walverd reminds us this will not this will not have a complete fulfillment until the time of the Great Tribulation. So that's what we call the eschatological Day of the Lord um, uh, fulfillment. There it is it is this mingled picture of judgment, regardless of when it occurs, that characterizes the Day of the Lord. Any period of an extensive divine judgment in the Old Testament is therefore quote unquote a Day of the Lord. He continues, all of them will be eclipsed, however, with the final judgment that culminates in the Great Tribulation and the Battle of the Great Day of God Almighty at the Second Coming of Christ. So he's talking about Armageddon. Let's keep reading. The other references cited contain similar material. Isaiah 34 seems to indicate that judgments will fall on the world in the events leading up to the Second Coming. We're talking about Day of the Lord definition, by the way. Probably the most graphic picture is found in the book of Joel, most of which is dedicated to describing the Day of the Lord. Included is the famous prophecy of the outpouring of the Spirit, quoted in Acts chapter 2, which occurred on the day of Pentecost, but will have its complete fulfillment in the days prior to the second coming of Christ. The judgments of God poured out on the earth, as well as disturbances in heaven, are graphically described by Joel. There will be great signs in the heaven, Joel 2, 30 and 31, described in more detail in the book of Revelation, and we have a quote here from the book of Revelation, uh, and I will show wonders in the heaven and the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And I believe that's Revelation chapter 6, if I'm correct, at the opening of the sixth seal. Walver continues, what is meant here, it's not that the day of the Lord will begin after these wonders in heaven, but that it will come to its climax when the judgment is actually executed. I'm not sure I understand what he's trying to say there, but if I understood it in the way that I read it, then I kind of disagree with him there, where he's saying that the Day of the Lord is going to happen after. Yes, I think I definitely disagree. He believes that the Day of the Lord begins at the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. In other words, the Day of the Lord and the wrath of God are synonymous terms, and it begins right after the rapture of the church, so therefore it begins at the beginning of the seven-year tribulation, and therefore the signs of the sun, moon, stars, and earthquake set, the, 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 the what we call cosmic disturbances, those don't take place until sometime inside of the 70th week by most people's standards. And so he's saying that um, those signs don't take, don't, play, don't take place chronologically before the day of the Lord commences. I disagree with him, by the way. I believe that those signs are to be taken chronologically as an indicator that the day of the Lord is about to commence. If we were to go back and read Revelation chapter 6, uh, when we get to the sixth seal about the the cosmic disturbances there, it is only then that the book of Revelation 
talks about that the peoples of the earth hide themselves in the rocks and tell the mountains to fall on them because the day of the Lord's wrath and the wrath of the Lamb is about to commence. And so I, I do take it uh, chronologically. So I disagree with Walvert here. I'm not a pre-tripper. Let's keep reading uh, Walvert. The book of Zephaniah adds another aspect to the day of the Lord. After revealing in some detail the judgments to occur at that time, the prophet describes the blessings that will follow. In Zephaniah 3, the prophet writes, quote, Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all the, with all the heart. O uh, daughter of Jerusalem, the Lord hath taken away thy judgments. Notice the language in Zephaniah describes the glorious restoration of Israel to the place where she enjoys favor from God and blessing from God, but it takes place only after the day of the Lord judgments have been poured out, not just on wicked humanity, but also the refinement that the day of the Lord is going to represent when it comes to Israel, uh, unsaved Israel's perspective. Two-thirds of Israel is prophesied to be um, killed or, or uh, judged and killed in the day of the Lord events, and it's only a third that's going to come out of that intense judgment and refinement to meet their lord of course we're talking about the salvation of israel that paul talks about in romans chapter 11 where all israel will be saved right around verse 25 if i remember so zephaniah is going to prophesy about this is this event right speaking of god he hath he uh, hath cast out thine enemy the king which would have been the antichrist the king of israel even the lord is is in the midst of thee, which of course is Yeshua, thou shalt not see evil anymore. Right? That hasn't happened yet. So clearly this is future. This is an eschatological prophecy that describes the day of the Lord events in proximity to bringing in, ushering in eternal righteousness within Israel's remnant, the survivors that made it through that time period and will survive to meet uh, the, their their uh, Messiah Yeshua. They've got their hearts softened, and grace has been poured out to them. Right, Zephaniah chapter Zechariah chapter fourteen, and they will not see evil anymore. Well, again, this hasn't happened yet because even right now, if you turn on the news, there's evil in Israel. Right, Israel still has their enemies all around her, and there's evil every day happening in the Middle East. But one day, all of that will cease. Uh, the prophecy continues, In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion, let not thine hands be slack. Again, these events haven't happened yet. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Again, these events take place in a partial fulfillment whenever God rescues Israel from her enemies, like when he rescued Israel from the Babylonians and brought her back into her land, restored the temple, and restored their freedoms. But it was only temporary because the temple ended up getting destroyed again by the Romans and the people went into exile once again. And they stayed in exile for almost 2,000 years until 1948 when they were able to return to their land. And now Israel became a state in 1967 and uh, we, thus we have a modern state of Israel today. But guess what? She's still surrounded by enemies. And guess what? The, the, the temple is still under the um, control of foreign powers right gentile armies namely the uh muslim um authorities so israel isn't completely restored yet so these words that we're reading about here in zephaniah haven't had their complete total fulfillment yet so let's keep reading how far can we get the significant truth revealed here is that the day of the lord which first inflicts terrible judgments ends with an extended period of blessing on Israel, which will be fulfilled in the millennial kingdom. I w agree with that 100%. And Walvoord reminds us that based on the Old Testament revelation, the day of the Lord is a time of judgment culminating in the second coming of Christ and followed by a time of special divine blessing to be fulfilled in the millennial kingdom. And now he's going to turn from that definition of day of the Lord and he's going to start talking about how that post-tribulational interpretations of the day of the Lord fall short because not only not only because of the timing of the day of the Lord in respect to uh, rapture and in respect to resurrection and in respect to the um, millennium period, but also because the day of the Lord is something that is according to post according to pre-tribbers the day of the lord is not something that is marked out 
for Christians. It's something that Christians are exempted from, which interestingly enough, all four of the views, and I'll, I'll kind of come, uh, close, come full circle and close with this, working backwards, pre, at least backwards on this chart that I had, working backwards from the four views, we have pre-wrath rapture, which puts, and I'm closing with this, we have pre-wrath rapture, which puts the rapture sometime in the second half of the of the three and a half years of the, sometime in the second half of the 70th week, so in the middle of the three and a half years or somewhere around that time, but rapture takes place chronologically, and then God's wrath is poured out. God's wrath is synonymous with the day of the Lord in this model, and it's the, the model that I'm holding to. So in this view, rapture takes place first, and God's wrath is poured out second. This is the only thing I want to show you in closing. Rapture first, day of the uh, God's wrath second. Looking at the post-trib view, we have God's wrath being poured out first, and then rapture takes place. So this is the view that is the odd man of the four that puts the order in reverse. Wrath is poured out first for the full seven years, and then at the end of the seven years, a quick up in the air rapture takes place, and then a, a quick back down to planet Earth second coming takes place according to this classic post-trib chart of which of those four five gentlemen that I keep mentioning, Dr. Brown, Dr. Keener, uh, Joel Richardson, Dr. Uh, uh, Moo, and then finally uh, John Piper, of those five, Joel Richardson is decidedly different from those uh, other pre post-tribbers in that he has a, a hybrid model that still puts rapture in front of wrath and the way he does that is he shrinks God's wrath to an absurdly small duration of maybe a mere mere months, uh, uh, maybe even only a month or a mere weeks. Uh, he, he, I think when I was listening to him last, he says it's something like maybe 30 days or even 45 days. So he puts God's wrath in that final 30 day and 45 day at the end of the um, uh end of the seven year seventh week of daniel he, he he condenses all of god's wrath into that time frame the, at the very end the last month or the last um for uh, 45 days in other words the last 75 day so he differs from the other gentlemen in that re regard and um moving along looking at the mid-trib god's wrath is shrunk down to half its size from the um other charts from the post-trib and the pre-trib so it's half the size it, it only covers three and a half years but in this chart, we still have rapture happening first and wrath happening second. So rapture first, wrath second. Notice the chrono chronological sequence of the events. Rapture first, wrath second. Although, again, I, I, I think the mid-trib has better legs to stand on than the pre-trib, uh, but I still uh, hold to the pre-wrath. And then lastly, the view that Dr. Walvard, whom we're borrowing his notes from, he holds to, which is the classic pre-trib uh, perspective, which is the most popular in Christian circles today, um, is that rapture happens at the beginning of the seven years, and then the entire seven years takes up the tribulation slash wrath of God. But notice the sequence of those two events again, comparison, rapture first, wrath second. So those are the sequence of again. So it's only the post-tribbers that swap those two around and put God's wrath first and then the rapture happening afterwards. All right, so having said that, I'm going to stop our study tonight and we'll pick this up next week starting right here with post-tribulation post-tribulational interpretation of the day of the Lord for um, a look at uh, this event um, through the lens of a prominent pre-tribber. But that'll do it for eschatology, a biblical study of end time events. These are the live internet studies brought to you week after week by myself, Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi. I'm a tour teacher here at Congregation Kei Latunavada Harvest in uh, Thornton, Colorado. Find us online at graftedna.com and join us in, in person for our live Sabbath services. But if you're not able to join us, at least as I mentioned, join us online and um, you can see the link to the video right there on my screen as well. These uh, live internet studies are a part of my own um, Torah teaching ministry, which parks itself on the web at tetzetorah.com. That's T-E-T-Z-E-T-O-R-A-H.com. I'd love to have you join me at my own home uh, personal website there and uh, browse around and take a look through all the uh, commentaries that you see on my screen right now as well.
I also have a YouTube channel that I'd be delighted if you uh, popped in and um, took a look around there as well. YouTube.com forward slash C forward slash Tate Torah Ministries. If you do hit my website, uh, my YouTube channel there, be sure to uh, take notice that I update the uh, site essentially daily, uploading videos daily. Make sure then to subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, leave thumbs up for all the videos that you like. Um, leave me some comments and questions about things you have um, uh, your own thoughts on. And be sure to share the content with your other friends and family members in your social media circles, okay? Just some brief important uh, details. If you'd like to join us for our live studies, be sure to get access to Skype somehow. If you're on my website right now, um, uh, during the live study and you click on that blue Skype link, it'll actually open up Skype in your browser and you can just join us right there. And we hope you can join us live because we engage in a uh, live Q&A after the study is over, opening up the microphones and it's exclusively to the um, uh, live studies um, uh, that we uh, enjoy engage in that live study uh, Q&A. But if not, um, take one last moment to scroll to the very bottom of my website where you can see some Hebrew writing and the black section down there and uh, preferably consider partnering with me to take the Torah around the world uh, in this particular format. You can click on the little yellow donate button and um, bless me that way with your uh, financial gifts and contributions and I'm so uh, blessed to be able to be in a place where I can receive uh, your generous gifts. Uh, thank you to all of those who have given in the past and are continuing to give. I'm so uh, thrilled to be on the receiving end of, of your generosity. And as I always say, be blessed as you seek to be a blessing to others. Let's turn to a Trinitarian response to biblical Unitarianism. My name is Ariel bin Lyman Hana V. Let's take 30 minutes and finish out our hour and a half long study. In case you didn't know it, know this or didn't know this it is an hour and a half long study you're only catching the last 30 minutes if you're watching this youtube video right now but the entire study is an hour and a half long live internet studies and the first hour is is uh, given over to a topic called eschatology a biblical study of end time events where we're talking about rapture right now with a view towards the book of revelation but we're parked out on this idea of rapture is it real and if it is when is it is it pre-trib is it mid-trib is it post-trib is it pre-wrath when is it so if you're interested in those types of talk topics catch the earlier part of my long live internet study the first segment okay let's turn to biblical unitarians perspective on a verse out of the old testament isaiah 9 verse 6 and we're at biblicalunitarian.com's website biblical unitarian is a non-trinitarian christian denomination and as i keep flashing the same graphic over and over on the screen in post-production which you're probably going to be seeing right now their perspective of Trinity is, in a nutshell, there's one God, He is the Father of Jesus Christ, He is synonymous with the, the uh, being identified as Yahweh in the Bible, but He's also the same being as, that's identified as the Father of Jesus. So, the Father is God, and God is Yahweh, and Yahweh is the Father, and so they're numerically one with one another, they, there's no difference between the Father and Yahweh and God. But when we look at Jesus from the biblical Unitarian perspective, Jesus is a man. He's a human being. He was born in the first century of human parents. He was brought into the world, but he lived a sinless life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he was crucified, resurrected, and ascended on high and now sits at the right hand of the Father. And because of this exaltation, and because of his position in God's uh, uh, plans, he is rightfully the only true Messiah that has come into the world, and he rightfully deserves to be called God in the sense of the special status that he receives uh, and favor that he receives from God, but it's only in a lesser sense. It's a lower G-O-D. Um, at the very least, he is deserving of worship by human beings because God deems it so. So we're not worshiping a, a God-man per se, and we're not worshiping an idol. We're worshiping the designated human that God uh, exclusively commands us. It's not even optional. God commands every man to worship Jesus because God commands it so. Therefore, Jesus can receive worship. But he's a human being. He's not deity. He's not a divine. Um, he's simply human. And then the Holy Spirit, uh, like the little graphic shows, the Holy Spirit is an impersonal force similar to Jehovah's Witnesses, but he is also simply God. 
so God is spirit and the spirit is God and God is holy and, and the spirit is holy. And so therefore the spirit is another name for God. The Holy Spirit is just another name for holy God. And the impersonal aspect is that God can send his spirit, his power into uh, the hearts of human beings, those of us who are believers, and empower us to do God's will. So in that regard, it's not God that enters into us per se. It's really just the power of the Holy Spirit. We could say it's God entering into us. Uh, I think many of them uh, hold that language. Okay, so that's the biblical Unitarian perspective. They're looking at Isaiah nine six, where Jesus. Well, I'm 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 um I'm betraying my bias when I say Jesus here. Let me look at the passage uh, as view the through the lens of uh, Revised English version. The REV, which is the version that the Trini the uh, Biblical Unitarian holds to, their perspective is that for for to us a ch let me highlight the uh, let's see if I can highlight the whole thing for you there. Uh, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he and and he will call his name Wonderful Counselor, Mighty Hero, Father of the Coming Age, Prince of Peace. Notice what they do with the titles that are given to this child which trinitarians believe is jesus this child is not called god in the biblical unitarian perspective instead god his father will call his name instead of saying he will be called uh as the um passive voice they put it back into um uh, kind of an active uh, using the Hebrew there, which I think is accurate, by the way. And he will call his name in the context that he would be um, God, because God is the one giving this prophecy to Isaiah. And he will call his name, and then we have Wonderful Counselor, um, which is fine by, by calling Messiah that, uh, doesn't indicate any type of divinity. Wonderful counselor. Mighty hero. Normally we're used to hearing as Trinitarians, mighty God. But it's because uh, Biblical Unitarian shows us that the Hebrew word for hero there or God that we see is Elohim. Or it's the shortened version of El. Um, El Gibor. Um, and this El is shortened form of Elohim, which is a word by context can mean either a divine God, it can mean an angelic being, it can mean uh, a human judge or a magistrate, a, a hero like Moses was a Elohim to Pharaoh. He was a mighty hero to the to the Israelites, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's why they opt for mighty hero, father of the coming age. Um, um, Avi Ad is the uh, Hebrew, the father of the coming age. The um, Ad there part of Avi, Avi is uh, our father or uh, father of, and then Ad there um, is translated as ages or eternity or something like that. The Biblical Unitarian translates this Hebrew word Ad as coming. Uh, or as it actually just as age, and then they insert the word coming in a context to indicate that Jesus is the father of the messianic age because of his death on the cross, the salvation that he offers to all believers. Um, that makes him the father of the messianic age properly in the sense that it's the, through the blood of Jesus that the messianic age will be established. And the theology there is rock solid. I believe that is true. Jesus is the father of the coming age. No question about that. But what they do is they remove the father of eternity because that smacks of divinity, right? When it's his father of eternity, it, we don't like non-Trinitarians don't like describing Jesus in terms of eternity past. They're fine with giving him the eternity future aspect, because that's true. He's going to live forever. So, But when it says Father of Eternity, it sounds like mm, he's someone who's divine. And then the last one, Prince of Peace, has no um, uh, dispute among between Trinitarians and non-Trinitarians. Sarah um, um, HaShalom, uh, which is the original Hebrew, is uh, for both of those. So we looked at different translations uh in time um and i suppose i should move that over there we we looked at different translations but here's the original hebrew and i'm sorry the original um english and hebrew as it shows up in the a non uh unitarian version so this is the nasb isaiah 9 6 for a child will be born to us a son will be given to us and the government will rest on his shoulders and now we hear the familiar language that we're used to hearing around christmas time and his name will be called wonderful counselor comma mighty god comma eternal father or everlasting father like the kjv has it i think 
and then comma prince of peace and the reason i'm telling you the commas is because depending on which version you use sometimes you'll have wonderful comma counselor comma or some jewish versions say wonder of a council is god almighty or something like that um giving what's what appears to be really paraphrases of this uh verse over on the right side of the screen here let me see if i can highlight it without doing damage there we go oh, nope didn't get it all let's try that one more time there we go the right side of the screen has the hebrew ki yelel yilad lanu ben nitan lanu vat hi hamisra al shikmo vaikrashmo pele yoetz el gibor aviad sarar shalom that's the hebrew and we looked at all of those hebrew terms uh last week go back and listen to episode number 251 or just look at my web go to my youtube channel youtube.com and um forward slash uh Tor ministries or something to that effect and you can find the previous videos that i just did we also looked last week at jewish translations of this passage the revised jps 2023 version has for a child has been born to us a son has been given to us and authority has settled on his shoulders he has been named the mighty god is planning grace the eternal father a peaceable ruler so they that's a, a, a paraphrase obviously it doesn't take the words literally but what they did do in previous translations if you look on the right side of your screen if, if i scroll down and show you the um the previous jps like the 1985 version or even the older 1917 version which is just below it all they did was from the 1985 version is they rewrote the 2023 version uh, the mighty god is planning grace the eternal father peaceable ruler but when they originally published the 1970 uh 17 version oops didn't want to do that give me a second go backwards when they originally published the 1917 version let me do that again um they simply had like that uh, for a child is born unto us, a son is given unto us, and the government is upon his shoulder, and his name is called, and then they don't even tell you what the name is. They just transliterate the Hebe, uh, the Hebrew, the Hebe. They transliterate the Hebrew, Pele Joetz El Gibor Abiad Sar Shalom, which is basically, again, translate, transliterated Hebrew. That's all they do. All right, let's turn now to looking at a little bit of the Greek. I'm not going to read all of the Greek, but it's going to be a relevance for some of our commentaries here in a moment because when we look at the greek we also find some paraphrasing going on in interpretation um this is the website of john barich um he personally translates the septuagint which is probably like britain septuagint i think um not britain's i'm sorry the alexandrinus septuagint on the left side of your screen there and the vaticanus trans uh translation on the right which is usually longer he translates those into a kind of a kjv looking stylistic english um up top and which reads for for to us a child is born to us a son is given and the government shall be on his shoulder i say kj kjv ish because it retains kind of the old english thou's and shalls and his name shall be called wonderful counselor the mighty god the everlasting father the prince of peace then we've got the hebrew there um in the middle and then we've got this greek from john barich um i'm sorry i keep saying john barich it's not his greek it's the or ancient manuscripts the website here belongs to john barich and the translation of the english above is john barich and the translation below here is also john's um verse six from john's translation john barrett she says because a child was born for us a son also given to us whose sovereignty was on his shoulder and his name is called a messenger of a great plan for i will bring peace on the leaders peace and health to him sounds similar to the modern jps translations and for good reason it's because the septuagint was translated by non-christian translators is translated by uh, uh, rabbinic jews well they weren't really called rabbinic jews but non-christian jewish translators they didn't have a christianity uh to work from so they and you know this, this is two centuries before christianity ever hit the scene in its proper form so they are translating they're they're translating along the ways of their understanding of what the original hebrew meant but to the right of the screen the vaticanus version um actually pulls in 
some of the translations, um, some of the extra words that belong to some of the original uh, JPS translation. So it reads, because it's a lot longer, so listen to this. Because a child was born for us, a son also given to us, whose sovereignty was on his shoulder, and his name is called a messenger of a great plan. And then in brackets, suddenly we have... Yeah, there we go. Uh, in brackets, suddenly we have wonderful counselor, mighty God, potentate, prince of peace, father of the age to come. And then end of brackets, for I will bring peace on the leaders, peace and health to him. So we've got some really differing translations. So it's not unusual and it's not even um, um, wrong for biblical Unitarian to just latch on to a different translation from a Trinitarian perspective. I don't have a problem with that, really. Uh, I mean, it's the translator's job to try to make the best of the original languages. What, what is the most important is really context. And as I demonstrated last week, or maybe the week prior when we first started looking at this, and when I read the entire kind of Isaiah 9, 1 through 9 um, in context, this child and the promise that God gives to him, and in fact, I'll just tip my hand and show you, when we get to verse 7 of this same prophecy, <clears throat> Isaiah says that of this child, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end on the throne of David and on his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth Ever, uh, even forever, the zeal of Yahweh of armies will perform this. So we end up with this very heavy language being attributed to this child of the scope of the reign of his kingdom. It's forever. It's established on the throne of David, and it will be established by Yahweh, by his father, henceforth, even forever. So if the Bible means anything in its natural language, then we would have to agree that this child's throne is one that is a kingdom that's without end eventually. And this accords with other places of the Davidic promises of the Messianic king that would sit on his throne one day, even given to David. David realized that he wasn't going to live forever, but David was given promises that his dynasty would go on into eternity through the reign of his descendant, namely the Lord that would sit at the right hand of David's Lord. Right, remember Psalm um, uh, one ten. The Lord said unto my Lord, "Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for your feet." This David king that's promised, uh, spoken of elsewhere in the prophecies, also in the book of Isaiah, is promised to extend his kingdom. <coughs> excuse me, into eternity one day. You know, Daniel chapter uh, 2, Daniel chapter 7, the Son of Man approaches the Ancient of Days and is given a kingdom that is without end. So, the Old Testament prophets, uh, by the prophecies about this Messianic king were always given within the scope of having a near-far aspect prophecy, right? The whole prophetic telescoping that we've been using in our eschatology study applies here as well. Um well, yeah, we talked about it in the in the prophet in the uh, eschatology study, but primarily we've been using it in this study, and that's the idea that in the Old Testament we have lots of prophecies that talk about things that are going to happen to Israel on a short term basis, like usually within a generation of the prophets' words being spoken, or sometimes within a hundred years of Israel's history, et cetera, et cetera, such as either judgments or promises of blessing or some uh, Davidic righteous king that's going to sit on the throne. Well, those all have short, near-term uh, fulfillments whenever a righteous king would sit on the throne of David. No problem with that. But the bigger aspect is that there's always a far-term, a near and a far prophecy. And the far prophecy is the one where it talked about um, language uh, of the magnitude and scope that has never actually been realized, even down to this day. Right, there are prophecies of the coming Messiah that are still yet to be fulfilled. The Messianic Age, the eternal kingdom that happened that uh, uh, extends well even beyond the Messianic thousand-year kingdom, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's the context that determines who this child will be ultimately. And from that perspective, we can definitely say that the ancient rabbis did notice that. 
they noticed it. It wasn't absent to them. So we have kind of two views going on. Ancient Judaism has a view that there's a Messiah who is a kind of a just a human being, like Biblical Unitarian says, and this Messiah could be born in any given age. And but uh, ultimately, there's no reason to equate him with a divine figure. He's just a human, um, but he has he enjoys special anointing from God, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then there's always another group of rabbis out there that believe that this refers to King Messiah, and we're still waiting for this um, really unique kind of div- uh, Messiah who who has qualities of divinity, but he's not God, right? He's he's still kind of demigod. Uh, you know, I don't think any rabbi is going to outright admit that that Messiah is is God, right? That just doesn't work for their from their theology. But having said that. Let's begin to turn now to a prominent Messianic author by the name of Dr. Michael Brown. Yeah, what you're seeing on your screen right now is a a five-volume set uh, um, labeled Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus. And Dr. Brown makes these available uh, at discount prices, like you can see on your screen right now. No, I'm not getting any kickbacks from Dr. Brown for this seeming little uh, uh, advertisement right now. I'm just showing you that the books are available on his website at thelineoffire.org. All one word, thelineoffire.org. Go click on the products um, link and follow the um, links to looking at these particular books. I highly recommend them. I've got them sitting on my shelf right here, and I've read through all of them, and we're going to be borrowing some notes from one of those uh, arguments that are that objects to Jesus, and Dr. Brown provides the rebuttal, the 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 answer, the to the objection. The objections are from a rabbinic perspective, where they're objecting that Jesus can't be Messiah because, and there's all these different reasons that they put out as to why Jesus can't be the Messiah, and one of them is an objection to the Isaiah nine passage, of which Dr. Brown supplies the the um. The answer. So let's begin looking at this night. This is dark. This is a website that um, has uh, represented the answer for us. Since I don't have the book scanned on my computer here, so instead I'm borrowing uh, the the answer which shows up on this website. You can find the answer in other places as well. Dr. Brown reproduces the answer on some of his websites, but it's not the full answer. It's only a partial answer. This website that I'm using right now uh, actually reproduces the entire answer, and um, the the link to the website is quite confusing. But if you're curious about it, write into me, send a, 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 a comment to the YouTube video, and I'll share the link with you. It doesn't show in the show notes. And so the objection is stated this way. Isaiah 9, 6 does not speak of a divine king or Messiah. That's the objection. Let's read, begin to read Dr. Not, Dr. Brown's answer. So, right, again, the objection. Isaiah 9, 6 does not speak of a divine king or a Messiah. And then we've got the verse showing up as a graphic. And now let's begin to read um, Dr. Brown's answer to this objection. And let me see, can I read through the whole thing? I might be able to get through all of this. We've got about 10 minutes left in study. Dr. Brown says, The most natural, logical, and grammatically sound translation of Isaiah 9, 6, or 5, in the Hebrew count. Remember, in the Hebrew Bible, often the scripture numbering is off by one verse, or I shouldn't say off, but it differs by one verse, sometimes two. Typically, it's it's practically the same. So, 9, 6 in the Christian Bible... 9 5 in a Hebrew Bible. And here's our um, translation, which is Dr. Brown's translation. For a child has been born to us, a son has been given to us, and the government shall be on his shoulder. And his name is called Wonderful Counselor, comma, Mighty God, comma, Father Forever, comma, Prince of Peace. My translation. Okay, notice he says Father Forever. We'll talk about that in, in time why he uses that. Dr. Brown goes on to say that. This is in harmony with other verses in our Hebrew scriptures that point toward the divinity, I'm sorry, point toward the divine nature of the Messiah, and the names of the child should be taken as descriptive of the Messiah himself. Continue. Since we have already dealt at length with the subject of the divine nature of the Messiah, including specific discussion of Isaiah 9, 6, and then he points you back to his previous uh, volume 2, um, where he's got uh, section 3, 1 through section 3.1 through section 3.4. Um, 
he and I've read that uh, also, and uh, it's quite uh, informative. He says, "What we're going to do now is we're going to look at the two questions here, returning to the question of the Messiah's divinity at the end of our discussion." First, Dr. Brown uh, begins to ask, um, what is the proper translation and meaning of the verse? And second, is it a messianic prophecy? Remember, according to Biblical Unitarian, the verse is mistranslated by Trinitarians. Let's read just their first point. Trinitarians should admit that this verse is translated improperly just from the fact that Jesus is never called the Everlasting Father anywhere else in Scripture. Indeed, Trinitarians correctly deny that Jesus is the Everlasting Father. It is a basic tenet of Trinitarian doctrine that Christians should neither confound the persons nor divide the substance. Thus, if this verse is translated properly, then Trinitarian Christians have a real problem. However, and here's their... um big beef with trinitarian theology however the phrase is mistranslated period full stop they don't even say that a better translation they just outright accuse trinitarian translations of which i've showed you there are hundreds that argue in the trinitarian in the favor of trinitarianism the phrase is mistranslated the word translated everlasting is actually age and the correct translation is that jesus will be called father of the age and then they in brackets they put coming age so that's why when we get to dr brown's um translation he's he's going to start talking about the what is the proper translation and remember his doctoral um, degree is in Near Eastern languages, right? He's got a doctor's degree in in ancient Near Eastern languages, so he's got a he's kind of a heavyweight when it comes to um, these particular matters of uh, uh, translation. So let's read what he has to say. The oldest Jewish translation of Isaiah nine six or five in your Hebrew, found in the Septuagint, and we looked at this um, uh, just a moment ago. The, the Septuagint understands all the names as referring to the king, rendering this verse into Greek as follows. Right, and here's a translation um, from the Greek. It says, "For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, whose government is upon his government is upon his shoulder, and his name is called the Messenger of Great Counsel." And the Greek of messenger of great counsel is megale he arche. And then it continues by saying, for I will bring peace upon the princes and health to him. I didn't show you that original Greek, um, but for those of you who like to see it, it is, let me see it here. Um, let's see. Megale arche. What did it say? His name shall be called wonderful counsel of the mighty God. Let me find it here for you. Megales Bules Angelos, uh, Father of the Ages. Um, uh, I Kalethai to Hanama out to Megales Bule Angelos, Ego Garda Adzo, a Rene Epitus Arcantas, a Rene Kai Hugian. Ugi Aeon Alto. And I'm reading this right here, of which let me see if I can blow it up for you. This is the part that says, and his name will be called Kai Kaletai Ta Anama, and the name of him, and the name and shall be called the name of him. If I literally translate Kai Kaletai Ta uh, Anama Autu, um Megales Bules Angelos, uh, uh wonderful counselor of uh, the the uh, what it was uh, me wonderful messenger a wonderful plan of the messenger or something that effect wonderful plan of a messenger yeah ego gar i don't want to read the rest there but the point is um dr brown is highlighting the fact that uh from the uh greek um messenger of a great plan and uh, uh, father of the ages, if we go back over here, um, father of the age to come. Uh, so um, we don't actually see the father of the age to come in this translation from the English. But if I go scroll up just a little bit to the Vaticanist translation and kind of tr capture that first part again. Let me see if I can shrink this a little bit and go like that so basically all of this part where it's a lot longer than the uh um shrink a little bit more a little uh, smaller than the uh, alexandrina one on the left 
this Vaticanus version, Kai Ka Leitai Ta Anama Autu, and shall be called the name of him, or and his name shall be called Megales Bules Angelas. And then we have um Thaumas Tas uh sambulas sum sumbulas and so this is where we start getting some extra uh wonderful counselor uh theos ikusa is cus is curas uh god here or god of the strong or strong god and some extra language let me see if there's the um the part that dr brown highlights i'm not seeing exactly this it's almost like dr brown is combining a bit of the Greek with the um, with the Hebrew when he says um, uh, messenger of a great council. I didn't see the hearchy, but I did see the megale or uh, yeah, I saw it in both versions. Uh, Megales is right there, which is kind of big or great. Um, mega is where we get our English word uh, from this Greek word, um, like mega, you know, Megatron in the Transformers or Mega Hit or Mega anything, right? Um, so uh, Megalase is that Greek word right there. So uh, I mean that shows up right here as well, and his name will be called Megalase um, Plan of the uh, which um, let me show you the English real quick, Messenger of a Great Plan messenger of a great plan uh messenger is uh angelos where we get our english word angel it's right there um bules is plan right there and megales is great right there so great plan of a messenger or great plan of an angel or megales bules angelos is the entire phrase right there so not exactly sure where uh, Dr. Brown got Megale Hearchi. I'll have to look. Maybe there's another Greek manuscript that I'm not aware of. Um, I'm not an expert on the Septuagint, so I apologize. Um, I'll go back and do a little bit more homework and find out wh where he's pulling that from. But, um, messenger of a great council for our being peace upon the princes and health to him. Doesn't detract from what Dr. Brown's primarily trying to say. Let's keep reading um, his uh, answer here. Um, let me go, go down to maybe uh, two more paragraphs, and then we'll, we'll break off and call this part of our uh, commentary quick. We'll pick, uh, quits. We'll pick this up next week. Dr. Brown says, concerning Isaiah 9, 6 and this child, the Targum, while explicitly identifying this as a messianic prophecy, renders the verse in Aramaic with an interesting twist. And his name will be called, from before the one who is wonderful in counsel, the mighty God who exists forever, Messiah, because there will be abundant peace upon us in his day. And this is translated literally. The problem with this translation, Dr. Brown says, aside from the fact that it is grammatically strained, is that Almost all of the names are heaped upon God, and only the last two are given to the Son, although it is the naming of the royal child that is central to the verse, right? And his name will be called. How odd. Clearly, the names refer to the Son, not to the Lord who gave them, right? Which is a good point to bring out. He continues, in other words, the Targumic reading rendering would be like saying, and God, the great, glorious, holy, wonderful, eternal, unchangeable, redeemable, and King and Lord, calls his name Joe. Right, pausing for effect there. So yeah, Dr. Brown has a point. There's no precedent or parallel to this anywhere in the Bible, and no logical explanation for this rendering, nor is it even a natural grammatical rendering of the Hebrew. And then I think what I'm going to do for you is we'll stop right uh, there. And we'll pick this up next week, beginning with this uh, uh, paragraph entitled, or where it begins, the, the characteristics of the royal child are central which are highlighted by here by his names. We're going to be continue looking at Isaiah 9, 6 through the lens of Dr. Brown, who is a prominent Messianic Jewish apologist. He's a Trinitarian believer as well, so he rejects Biblical Unitarians' rejection of Trinity. So, Dr. Brown's refutation that we're reading here is was not written to refute Biblical Unitarianism per se. It was written to refute rabbinic judaism's monotheistic treatment of the messiah in the old testament and their rejection of new testament trinitarian incarnation and uh, trinitarian theology but the interpretation and the the uh, um the commentary that we're reading through from his book here applies in answer to the argument uh, from the Biblical Unitarian perspective, which is a rejection of Trinity. So we're borrowing Dr. Brown's notes. We'll pick this up next week, but that'll do it for a Trinitarian response to Biblical 
Unitarianism. Let's close in prayer. Abba, I bless your name. And I thank you for the studies. I thank you that I'm able to share my notes and my thoughts with the students. I don't have perfect understanding. I make many mistakes along the way. There are a lot of details that I am, in fact, ignorant of. And I'm happy to uh, share those um, errors, those, those, um, those faults, those weaknesses with other people, because I want others to realize that I am just a biblical student, just like everyone else. And I'm trying to veil myself of the meaning of the text, just like everyone else does. I don't have any special privilege of understanding what the Bible is teaching, other than that I have the Holy Spirit inside of me, like all believers do. So for that reason, Lord, I'm simply going to do the same thing that everyone else needs to do, which is I'm going to read, I'm going to study, I'm going to pray, I'm going to rely on the Holy Spirit to explain these things to me. And I'm also going to utilize other commentaries that other believers have um, written, because I believe that's the proper way to come to a better understanding, using the different insights that God has shown to other believers. That's my responsibility to um, utilize their insights as well. So thank you, Lord, for this shared effort that so that we can all come to a better knowledge of the truths of your word. Continue to equip us and raise us up and protect us and give us um, opportunities to share our witness with those around us. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. 